sorry Everybody. about your coffee this morning. <laughs> it's not it's it's not easy getting to the other side of the quarter too. The sun in the morning here in Louisiana is like feels like 200 degrees in humidity. Like I'm like drenched in sweat just walking like eight blocks. Like I mean it's it's no it's no no joke. <laughs> Hey, Doug's here. Um, Doug's joining us for a minute this morning, right? He's yeah, oh. yeah. He's going to give us the, the quick skinny on what's going on at live from the drive-in. Okay. Do we want to do that first? Oh wait, uh, we Mark have to. We have to because no, time he's just available. It. Is that a jean jacket shirt or is that or is that jean shirt? No. Are you full Canadian today? I'm most certainly not. <laughs> <That's true. laughs> been 90 degrees and we've been doing 20 hour days so I'm comfortable at this point. <laughs> Welcome. You might be able to see a stage behind me. Wow, gigging. Take, take a look at this. Look at you. Look at that. I miss that. Great. Beautiful. It's a beautiful thing and I have the site to myself. There's not a person here yet. So the questions haven't started, which is spoiled. a thing. We're spoiled. <laughs> the best time of day at the venue. Yeah, absolutely. Before everything. Oh, yep. For students, this is a sneak peek of our, our episode coming up on Monday, uh, where uh, Doug and his crew are going to recap the show that they are doing in Toronto. So it's going to be really cool to uh, kind of get behind the scenes look. Doug, thank you so much for doing this. Got some Look at that. We got our beautiful day here in Ontario. We got cameras all over the place. <laughs> Good show, friend. Good show. Good show. Absolutely. Yes. So um, let me see if I can flip this right, right? Um, yeah, we've been on site for a couple of days, had a couple of 20 hour days. It's been it's been interesting for everyone getting back into the into the swing of things. I think everyone's bodies are aching big time, but it's been great. And last night was our first show night and it was, it was, it was amazing. It was really special to be here with everybody. Um, and it was amazing. And we have, um, we had a live stream of it last night. Um, we also have another show tonight, another sold out show tonight. Um, and we are, our live stream partner has been kind enough to offer um, free access to our students to the, the live stream if they would like access to it. Um, it goes out live at 9, 9 p.m. Eastern this evening, but um, you will also be able to access it for the next 24 hours after it goes live. So if anyone would like to check out the show, um, the artist is called July Talk, a Canadian artist who I've been working, had the pleasure of working with for a couple of years. Um, and they have just assembled the crack team of some of the most talented um, creative film people in all of Canada for this show. And I, I cannot tell you how great the show looks online. It is like a film noir documentary style production. And it is amazing. It's mind blowing. We were all Jaws hit the floor last night when I walked around the site. So, um, yeah, if anyone would like to sign up for the, to your email, either in the chat or to our email, which uh, can somebody remind me the, the email address? It's tourmgmtorg at gmail.com. Got it. Okay. So, um, shoot us your email before the end of today's webinar. And then we, you will receive a sign up link and you can either watch it live tonight at 9 p.m. Eastern or you can catch up for the 24 hours after that. Um, and then you'll have a reference point for the webinar that we're going to be doing on Monday. Yeah. So, yeah, um, I'm going to leave you guys. I'm going to go do some work before I get fired. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Stay safe out there, Doug. Thank you. Um, have a great webinar and I will see you all on Monday. Yeah, be safe. Peace, guys. Bye, Doug. Bye, Doug. Good show. <laughs> Thank you. That is going to be an exciting one, which and that's exciting. Really I'm jealous, right? Um, to see all that gear, like that's exciting. Like somebody got to go and set all that up and hang lights and shit. Like, I, I wonder if they they turned on the PA yet. They don't have one. They don't have one. Right. That's right. Yeah, he's <laughs> got those light fixtures there, which is rad. 
Um, but uh, he, he said he said he did text me and tell me that that the first time back in a truck truck doing a truck pack was a comedy of errors that was hilarious <laughs> you know and and 20 hour days are yeah. unusual <laughs> at this point <laughs> yeah. good I mean, they, they shouldn't be normal anyways but well that's yeah. true let's kick off the show mark what episode are we on <laughs> Yeah, you know, that was a great opening with Doug. Um, we have made <laughs> we we have made it to webinar number forty. What a highlight! Uh, I've been looking back and just been counting the numbers up, and this has been an exciting journey for us and everyone who has been here with us from the beginning, and to all the new students and colleagues alike who have, have uh, been a part of this. Um, today we are jumping into case studies, so we're going to be talking about real life scenarios and events that's happened to us on tour where we really had to step up to the plate. Um, as, as you all know, Henry will get us started with it and uh, we'll, we'll kind of dive right in, kick this yeah. off. Thanks, Mark. Okay, so like you said, today's lesson is critical thinking at its finest. When the shit hits the fan and the buck stops with you, what will you do to make sure the show must go on? Today, we the teachers are going to share a moment in our career when we were faced with a challenge. We are going to set up the real life scenario and the problem we faced. We're then gonna ask you, the class, what would you do? How would you handle it? And what should you be thinking of? We want you to put your thoughts in the chat. And since this is a classroom, we will be calling on people at random to share your thoughts. So be prepared to engage. The last step of this case study is that we're going to tell you the rest of the story, what we did, how we got it done, and what we learned from it. So let's get started. Our first case study is with MJ. Hi. Um, all right. Here we go. So um, let me give you a little bit of backstory on this. So this was an early tour of mine, um, early in my career. Um, I was touring with a legacy act. So um, very well known, very experienced. Um, these guys have been touring for, I mean, some of the guys in the band have been touring for 40 years. Um, they were really, really good at taking themselves. They were always early. They read all the day sheets. Um, very, very professional. Same with the crew. Um, we were traveling with a core crew. Um, a lot of the guys had been with, their techs had been with them for a long time. Super professional, um, very team oriented. I was by far the youngest person on the tour <laughs> by about 25 years at least. <laughs> um, at least uh the next youngest person to me um and it was an early tour and we were going to i had done a couple of u.s legs with them um and we were going to europe and i had been touring in europe before um usually as the assistant tour manager taking care of an artist uh running my own float dealing with my own bus driver and stuff but this was my first time being completely in charge of a tour of the whole tour um uh, we had uh, one of the one of the musicians in the band. Uh, the main guy lived in the UK. Um, previously to this, uh, our front of house engineer had been doubling as production manager. But for this one, he had done a lot of the advance with me. Um, but we had a production manager from the UK meeting us. Um, so we were just the production was getting big enough. We needed the separation. So we had, he uh, had done a little bit of the advance, but uh, mainly we had done the advance. Um, and then we had hired um, somebody, uh, a friend of ours, who's another tour manager uh, named uh, Heike Kramer, um, who uh, was in Germany and she put together the tour books for us. And so she, they were new to our organization, but they had done a little bit of the logistics, um, just pu pulling together the information. Um, so that was what we had going on. We were getting ready to go to Europe. Um, it was, uh, we were starting in Bergen, Norway, which is about as far north as you possibly can go. Uh, the first show was June 1st, um, which meant the sun was never going to go down the whole time we were there. Um, which was interesting. <laughs> um, and we had two days of rehearsals prior to that. So we were flying. Uh, I wasn't able to make a schedule in time to show you guys visually, but we were flying on, I believe it was a Wednesday. Um, and what I did with all the US based people, band and crew, because it was, it was really tight knit and they liked to travel, travel together when possible. 
um, the band and core crew. Uh, we always stayed in all the same hotels. They just like to just keep it very family. So what I had done for all the US people is we had all flown um, to Chicago. I flew everybody to Chicago where we laid over. And at that point in time, uh, there was a Chicago Oslo nonstop. Um, and there was only like one connection a day in Oslo to Bergen. It was the only option. Um, so uh, I believe it left about it left about 9 p.m. So everybody gets in. It's about 7 p.m. It's a Wednesday. So it was really, I mean, it's, it was an O'Hare. So it's just dead in the airport. There's like nothing going on at that point. Tuesdays and Wednesdays are really slow in airports. Um, so we're on the concourse. Um, uh, we didn't, we didn't really have enough time to go to a lounge. It was really far. So everybody just hanging out at the, at the gate or wherever. Um, and I had to make some calls and do a little emailing. So I went over, you know, just found like one of those quiet nooks where there nobody is and you know, all the seating is, um, there's nobody there. And so, uh, I did some emailing and I had, you know, my stuff out, had a notebook out, computer, computer carry on. And, uh, as we were, there was a bank of like old um, pay phones on the wall right there. So as, you know, it's getting to be time to go to the gate and I set my notebook and my passport that had my boarding pass stuck in it and like a couple other items on top of the pay phone um, and turned around and was packing up my computer, putting everything away. Um, and I turned around and everything was gone from the top of the payphone. It was just gone. There was nothing there. And I'm like, what? And I look around, I see some cleaning crew, but they seem too far away. So I was like, did they pick it up? So I just started asking anybody that I could see, like, did you see somebody pick something up? Nobody saw anything. I asked somebody from the cleaning crew. Um, they didn't speak English. So the first thing I did was went over to, we weren't that far from security. So I went over to the information desk at security and I told them what had happened and I asked what I should do. And at this point I didn't, I wanted to sort of get my bearings, didn't want to let anybody know uh, from my touring party what was going on until I figured out what was going on. And uh, the people at the info desk at security said, well, um, you know, we'll put a note into lost and found uh, it's likely that one of the cleaning crew picked it up. We'll make an announcement. However, most of them speak Polish and may not really be paying attention to English. <laughs> so they made an announcement. Uh, nothing happened. And at this point, it's 30 minutes until boarding. And I, I'm just, I know I'm not, I'm not getting on that plane. It's just not happening. So I go over, I pull the, you know, the front of house guy who had previously been production manager aside and tell him. And then we tell the whole group um, and uh, yeah, so that's what happened. Um, oh, and the other thing was, is I went to the, I went to the desk of the airline because at this point I'm thinking, okay, what's the next flight and uh, ask them what the next flight is. And um, they say, well, you know, the next flight that would get you there would be tomorrow, but every flight sold out. For the next couple of days, um, so yeah, that was. We'll stop there and let you guys <laughs> think about what to do. <laughs> do after you picked your heart up off the floor, <laughs> and it dropped. That I've lost a passport. That is the scariest thing in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, I've actually lost a passport in an airport as well, so I know that feeling. But um, yeah. okay, what do you do? Um, your band and crew are all there. You're, they're getting on the plane and it's about to board in 30 minutes, but you're not. Yeah. Uh, okay. Who do you call? What should you be thinking of? I want to start seeing some, uh, some thoughts in the chat. Take a second. Like who's your first call in a situation like this? Anybody? 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 <laughs> Throw it out there. All right, <laughs> I like that, Stacy. Cry a little bit. <laughs> American Embassy. Speak to your travel agent and whoever's handling visas. Call the promoter. Seeing some pretty good answers in there. 
Brandy. Yeah. <laughs> Throw up in the ladies' room. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Pretty much. And then <laughs> that make sure someone is in charge. I mean, you did yeah. go to the PM, or he used to be PM. He, yeah, we were getting bigger. So we were dividing it up. He wasn't wearing two hats anymore, but yeah, he was PM. So he knew the gig. Well, okay. What's going to happen without you at that point? Let's walk through that just a little bit to see what's like, I actually don't even want, I don't want you to tell the answer, but think about it. Your, your tour is going forward to the first day without you. Oh, oh man, I just got chills on my arm. <laughs> like that is, um, that's scary because you know what, at that point I would be thinking, you know, I, I got to deal with myself, but first I need to alert the other side. Right. Or like, I'm going to sort myself out, but I need to make sure the tour is good on the other end. Like maybe just let everybody know it's going to be a different face and contact. Oh, I'm okay. going to, I'm going to answer really quick. Everybody's asking about copies of passports. I did have copies of all passports, but you can't get on a plane with a, with a copy of a passport. Yeah. So <laughs> oh. anybody else thoughts? Mark five, one. Um, yeah, I mean, I saw a similar situation, but it didn't involve passports, you know, definitely making it known to the other side of the, of the uh, fence that you're not going to be present and just kind of lining up your ducks in a row to find out who's going to be your key point kind of running ship there. And if, if you don't have anyone on your team, uh, that it would be a TM specific person, you know, fall on the promoter and find out who's going to be the main venue contact. If it is a venue show, if it is a festival show usually try to run logistics around like HR, hospitality, make sure their movements are on point. So that way when they do land, it seems very seamless um, in production. But yeah, definitely like what Henry was saying, like if you're not gonna be present, someone's gotta be, your ducks have gotta be on the, in a row and been, you know, be made aware that you're not gonna be present. So that's, that's kind of where I'm at is just preparing for them to be there without you, so. Anybody wanna join us live and, and walk us through what you'd be doing the point of this is to to look at the thought process and oh i wanted oh sorry oh. henry go on i wanted to mention what I, something i forgot to mention was that the um security desk had said that there would be a shift change at 3 a.m of the cleaning crew so it was a possibility they might turn it in there and but to just plan on going to the embassy at that point what time was it at, At this point, it's 9 p.m. <laughs> so the there flight is taken off, is getting ready to take off. It would have been about 8.30 because yeah, the flight's getting right. ready to take off. Or no, it would have been, sorry, it was 30 minutes to boarding. So it would have been about 7, 7.30. And yeah. the embassy, and the embassy was a, closed at this point or was it? Yeah, there's a consulate in Chicago, but it was way closed. Okay. And shift change, there was a possibility that somebody might turn it in at 3 a.m. But yes, no, there was not, there was nobody to reach. And the emergency after hours number just said call in the morning. Yeah, also, also to note, just being in Europe can be relatively difficult to reach your team in the States too, especially if it's later in the day, you know, that can be, that can be very difficult. So you can find yourself in a position internationally where your team might be asleep. I mean, being in Europe, you are ahead, so you do have that going for you, but not to sh sheer off on that, but um, that is something to point out. Yeah, no, that's a good point. I, I like, somebody said, um, oh, where was it? That the point that you made about having a legacy act helps in this situation, because they've done this, they know what's going on, they're not newbies, so you don't necessarily have to hold their hands. Um, Sarah Miller, you had a great response. I threw you on the screen if you want to jump in. Hey, walk me through what, uh, through what you typed in the chat. What would you do? Um, so the first thing you do is you put someone on your team in charge. Whoever's your second in command, whoever you trust the most, that's who you say, hey, this is going on. I need some help with this because I'm going to have to stay here for another day or two. Uh, here is the contact of the person who's supposed to be picking us up at the airport. 
here is the contact of whoever is supposed to be giving us the keys at the hotel. And then you can send them emails to intro to them to each other so that they can do it without going through you while making sure that you're still available by phone when they land. Even if it's 4 a.m. or 5 a.m. where they where you are, have your phone on. Yeah, you're up. You're calling that hotel. You're calling everybody right before they get there. Um, that's a good step, right? I mean, that's that's the first step, right? Okay, so you've yeah. alerted. Now, maybe assume, let's assume that they're good, right? You've made those connections. Now, what do you have to do at this point? Like, you've got to, you said that you may be able to find it at the shift change at 3 a.m. That chance maybe but it probably won't show up or the airport may not even be open or that desk won't be open at that time um you know you may be thinking like i may need to get a whole new passport rushed and so you're looking at time frame probably calling brandy Lindsay. how can i expedite in 24 hours uh chicago there is uh, uh an embassy yeah. that um, yeah there's a consulate that issues a consulate. Yeah. you could probably do it um yeah. i mean this is crazy but uh Somebody else? <laughs> I'm kind of uh, in suspense. You guys want to hear what happened? Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, so what happened was that, yes, I did. I did that. Um, and, and it was an asset. It definitely was an asset having a legacy act that were extremely professional. Um, you know, that was one of my biggest freak outs is I'm like <laughs> this young kid. <laughs> who's like leading their first tour in Europe, you know, I mean, I've been touring in Europe before, but first time being like, you know, steering the ship, but they were great. And, and they, uh, it was definitely an asset that they, they just knew to like, listen to whatever the plan was and trust in it. Um, they were great. Um, what I did was I did, I sat down with the, the front of house engineer who I said had, had previously been um, the production manager and had helped a lot with the advance. So, you know, he knew the logistics and I put, I mean, this was pre Dropbox. So I, but I had a little, I used to always have a little thumb drive, put every single one of my files on a thumb drive and handed it to him. I cranked out the next two days day sheets um, because no master tour um, while we were sitting there and I did them in a format that he could adjust if he needed to. Um, cause I didn't know if the internet would be crappy there or not. Um, so I handed that to him, um, called the, I had two travel agents. I had a U.S. travel agent that did international flights and then the UK travel agent, uh, who did hotels. And, um, I mean, this is the benefits of having a really good entertainment travel agent because I called her and she immediately got on with the hotel and made sure all the key packs were done, gave them specific directions, said she would call in the morning before we got there, where she would monitor their flights. Um, one of the key things that I said was that we had a friend that was a tour manager who is putting together the tour books for us and getting some of the preliminary information and venue stuff. And she was in Germany, so she was in the same time zone. And she was extremely familiar with this little arts, uh, well, it wasn't little, but it was like an arts, center in Bergen. So she was able to call up there and talk to them directly. Um, so utilize your contacts, um, you know, anybody you have working for you and, you know, obviously called the, the new production manager, called everybody to let them know what was going on. Um, so once I got them on the plane, um, I actually, instead of getting a hotel, I spoke with a friend who lived in Chicago, who was also a touring person. And she lived within a mile of the consulate. So I asked her if I could come to her house and crash out because it just seemed to be the most lo the most logistically friendly thing. So I would be, rather than getting an airport hotel, I thought, well, I'll put myself in the position of being able to just like be at the consulate when the doors open in the morning. Um, went to the security desk and just like had a conversation with them, gave them my number, um, made sure that the guys there, um, they did not have a shift change until five in the morning. So I knew they would be there when there was a shift change, but I just like really got on them, explained my situation. It's like, this is really important. Uh, that point, um, as I'm on my way to my friend's house, um, I called my US travel agent because there's no flights. 
Like it, there's like, I mean, there's not very many connections from, even if I was to do a double connection, there's not many other flights to get me to Bergen. So I'm thinking like, okay, do I have to take a train? Like, what do I have to do? But my travel agent who was doing international flights, who's also an entertainment specialized travel agent said, she just said, leave it with me. And I was like, okay. So she's like, let me know as soon as you know, if you need to go to the embassy or if you find the passport. She's like, I don't even care what time it is. Just let me know. And so, um, so I go to my friend's house, go to sleep, you know, got all my ducks in a row of what I need to do at that point, uh, to go to the consulate the next day. Um, at that point, uh, I was actually working. I don't even know if Brandy was there working then, but I was working with traffic control group. But at that point they were just like, you are better to just go into the consulate. Like they're like, you're just going to waste time if we start working on this. Like you just need to walk in, you have everything you need. So yeah, go to my friend's house, go to sleep, ready to go to the uh, consulate the next morning. And at 3.30 AM, I get a call <laughs> that my passport has been turned in at shift change. <laughs> so uh, call my, well, at this point there's no flights. <laughs> so <laughs> as far as I know. So I let my travel agent know and she's like, well, get some rest because, you know, she's like, just call me in the morning, call me at like 8 a.m. So I get some sleep and uh, I call her in the morning and she's like, okay. She's like, go to O'Hare. You're going to be on the same flights just a day later. But she's like, this is what you need to do. You need to, you're going to walk up to the counter. They're going to tell you the flight is sold out. There's no seat for you. And just tell them to look in their system. And she was just like, just trust me, just tell them to look in their system. And that happened. I walked up and they're like, nope, you're not getting on this flight. And, uh, and I said, well, my travel agent just said to look. And I, I see the, the uh, uh, counter agent, their eyes getting really big. And they're like, I don't know how your travel agent did this, but you're on this flight. <laughs> and so went there, got to Oslo. Uh, I think it was actually, he might have actually been in, you know, now that I think about it, it might have been an earlier flight to Oslo, but because I had a really, really long layover, but I got to Bergen and I actually got there 24 hours later. So I got really lucky that they turned it, everything, nobody had missed a beat, you know, band was, was they were just down with like, as long as you're organized and your clear communication, we're good. But to this day, I do not know what my travel agent did. And that is the wisdom of having an amazing entertainment travel agent. I do not know what she did. <laughs> two, actually. You had two. two. In I had two. So yeah. That's, yeah. that was a huge help, right? Because you had one focusing on one problem on this end of the pond while the other was sorting you out. That separation right there saved a lot of time. Yeah. Uh, wow. Was it a show day or? No, we were going into two, two rehearsal days, but we had all the vendors and everything coming in. So it was more production heavy. So, um, and you know, we, and we had a really, really good production crew and stuff. So they were, they were kind of more in the driver's seat at the venue anyway, but yeah. So. Derry, have you had anything like that happen to you before? Oh, you're muted, Siri. I have had scares, but I've not, <laughs> it has always turned up at the last minute. Yes. <laughs> more, more, of, more like me or someone else always keeps their passport in a specific place, but when they got on the plane, stuck it somewhere else because it was just more handy. And then, ah, where's my passport? And you dump out your backpack six times looking for it. And then it finally turns up in a very strange place, which, yeah. And then you're like, everything's fine. Nothing happened. Everything's fine. No problems here. <laughs> Crazy. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your input. That's amazing. Thank you, darling. Love you. All right. See ya. And I kept working, which is the important thing with an amazing, wonderful band. There's, there's <laughs> no better feeling to see your efforts work, work like that. You know, like if, if a situation like this occurs and you, you finally make it and you see everyone happy and things running, you're like, wow, you know, my, everything that we've done to, to keep our ship moving is still, still grinding. So. I want to ask, yeah. what's the right decorum to walk in with when you get to that venue? But calm. Yeah. <laughs> um, maybe, maybe sorry here or there. I don't know. I don't know if 
Like it's people may be really excited to hear your story of how you got through it. And then it's like, if you're late, it's kind of like if you're late for bus call, go apologize to everybody. (laughs) I do have to say that one of the best things about working with a legacy act is I got to hear some great stories from the band where they're like, Oh, don't worry. This happened in like 1970 or nine or, you know, or 1980s, like crazy stories. So it, it was a bonus of, them trying not to make me feel so bad (laughs) that I got to hear some really amazing stories about touring in like the early 80s and crazy stuff so you know (laughs) I really like that this is fun doing this I I don't you know I don't think my story is as fun as that I've honestly to the to the class I've like changed up my story a couple of times I've been battling with which one I should share it's hard to do these lessons uh because for for so many reasons of you know, we, we sign NDAs, so we, we have to try to be uh, careful about what we say. Uh, as well, we're trying to pull together the right lessons. So I'm actually going to put this up to the class. I got two stories, two lessons that I could share right now. One is, um, now, th- mine, my two are, MJ's is a great story of, say, like, a reactive scenario, where shit hit the fan, you have to react. Now, my two stories is on the other side of the coin, when you are asked to make something happen that's going to be really tight it's going to be really challenging but can you pull it off you know so i got two stories like that one is um uh basically a a story of how a high stakes operation of getting an artist in and out of mexico in under four hours or how i got a band uh, I was doing a Guinness Book of World Record run down to Antarctica. Which, you guys, which one do you guys want to hear? I always want to hear about going to Antarctica. That's just I want to Antarctica all day. My, on May. We can go. We get in and out yeah. of Mexico all day. I just want to know about. Yeah, Antarctica. I don't want to know about Antarctica. Mexico, no big deal. Antarctica, <laughs> let's go. All right. Well, this one I didn't have as prepared, but. It's still a good story nonetheless, and I, I have some shareables, but um, uh, I was working with a band in, I think this is 2008, that was going to make a, they wanted to make a world record attempt at playing seven, being the first band to play all seven continents. Uh, we had uh, we had five under our belt at that time already, so we just needed uh, to do a, um, a South America show, and then obviously Antarctica, right? Like no one really goes down to Antarctica to do shows, but the band wanted to. Um, so I was asked to figure it out. How do we make this happen? If we need to go do a show in South America, where do we put it that makes sense? How do we get to Antarctica from there? And then this is also going to be part of a world record attempt. So um uh, I should say that the uh, we had a host from MTV uh, and, a, and a film crew with us. So it was like, you know, daily news on MTV. Uh, I also had uh, the adjudicator for the Guinness Book of World's Record with us. Um, and uh, here, I'll give you a little bit of criteria as well. To, for the Guinness Book to recognize it to be an actual show, uh, a concert, it had some parameters to it. One, uh, it had to be electric. Uh, an acoustic guitar on a stool wasn't going to actually count as like a live concert. So it ha- uh, instruments had to be electrified. Um, one, there. Uh, two, there had to be uh, some sort of money exchange for a ticket. It's a show, you buy a ticket, you have to come in. It's not a free show. So, um, and then... Um, and then we had to play a certain amount of time. Uh, so knowing that, these are the parameters. Let's start with that. Like, where do you even start to try to find out how to do something like this? There's no promoters down there. Any thoughts? Any thoughts? Um, did you have a base camp to speak with or is that, I mean, I would assume that where you're going, there's, there's going to be like kind of a base camp where you're, you're coordinating with, or no, is it completely just barren? Right. Well, I'm gonna... Yeah. I would need to know. I would need to know who's inviting you there. See, that's the thing. No one. Okay. I'm going to say, get someone to charter a ship 
and do a cruise is technically in the radius of Antarctica. I'm like, well, how much do heaters cost? Well, really and hot heaters. I mean, you're going, you're, you know, logistically, you're definitely going down to South America and probably jumping off from Patagonia, Southern point of Argentina, maybe, because that's sort of your, your most su Southern point before you get to Antarctica. So whatever you're trying to do, you're trying to get out and get from this, you want to fly to South America and then, and then figure out if it's a ship or a, or a plane to get you from, let's say Patagonia is what I'm thinking. Yeah, that's a good I, yeah. I would also wonder, do you have a location or an idea of a location yet in your mind? Do you know, do you know where you're headed? Do no, you know where you're point, trying to set up? At this point, I know as much as I told you, it's figure it out from here, find a contact that would give us a, uh, a, a place, a, a venue, what's available, what time, who's, you know, who, who owns it, how do we do it? How do I get the gear down there? Um, you know, what type of gear can I move? I, I, um, in a scenario like this, you know, space, every, everything's in question, right? And um, I have a lot of people in tow. I do need Who, to bring equipment. Who's your, who's, who's your, ben, who's the benefactor? Who's paying for this? The band. Who's the band. So this it, is. It was an endeavor that they wanted to do. So um, they chose to take on this challenge and it was, it was up to myself and the management team to figure out how to make a, an attempt happen. Um, there's great stuff in the chat here. Let's see what's going on. Um, who was it Stacy said about um, Taurus? Yeah, Taurus do go down to Antarctica. I've seen it. I, I you know, um, one of the most heavy travel days based in a local town. Shwaya. Everybody's looking up Antarctica on their computers right now. Oh yeah, Ush Ushuaia is the place that all the it's like the port that all the research ships go from. Okay. Well, here, I'll just go ahead and get uh, and tell you guys. Well, hang on. Sound uh, quality isn't an issue. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Good thoughts. Good thoughts. I actually didn't think about that. Uh, all right. I would, I would read, I mean, I would reach out to, for me, I would reach out to like, companies that do cruise ships so it became an intense amount of research to find ways and connections to get down there and so what actually is down in antarctica is sort of a partnership um, of many countries around the world nobody owns anything they all just sort of have an area of land that they do research um, scientists military uh, are just down there at any given time there's you know, 40 to 4,000 different scientists down in Antarctica doing different things um, for different countries. So um, uh, long story short, we made a good connection with, uh, with the Chilean government who had a base down there. And uh, so as Adrian pointed out, this made a really great opportunity for us to then um, uh, hit a show in Chile and then head down there because logistically Patagonia and Chile is the southernmost country uh, on, on that continent. Um, so we made a connection there. They alerted us that in their uh, freezing white world that they live in down there, there actually is a little bar um, that they all go to. All the different countries gather at different times of the day and uh, we'll just hang out and talk science but they have a little bar and there's actually a little stage over there uh so they sent me pictures of the crappiest little stage you've ever seen and a little bit of gear um and so we pieced together with what was available down there and what i would need to bring uh equipment wise to know that i had an a and a b scenario um, of making a live show happen with a four-piece band um since we had the the relationship with the government, uh, really, we, um, I'll skip forward because we did the show in Santiago. From there, we moved down to Punta Arenas, which is the southernmost little village you can go in this world. It's about a, a, a three hour jump point from Antarctica. Uh, it's the most beautiful little place. If you ever get down there, go see the penguins. Um, but uh, we found that to be our base. So 
we did the show, got to Punta Arenas as a base camp before we were going to meet the team that was going to take us uh, in, a, in a plane to Antarctica. We had uh, advanced everything on site down there. It was all set up. We had to get creative, like I said, in, in the money exchange for the ticketing. And on a military basis, there couldn't be any exchange of money for entertainment goods. So we had to uh, make the ticket a $1 donation of any currency that you had for a ticket into the show. I actually, here, look, here is a ticket to the show. Oh, that's cool. Can you guys see that? Yep. So, I'll, I'll show you that in a second. So, um, we figured everything out. Everything had been advanced. We had moved down there. We were, and I was waiting for the call at 4.30 a.m. the next day for weather, whether it was a go, no go for launch. Weather's good, weather's no good. I get a call, 4.30 in the morning. Weather's no good. You're not taking off today. Stay in Punta Arenas. Have a good day off. Ah, bummer. We had MTV crew with us, the adjudicator, and we're not making it today. Hopefully tomorrow. Let's just enjoy the day off. 4.30. Henry, Henry, could everybody stand by? I mean, the mission was to go and do this show. So well, I'm assuming. So we had a little bit of time in our schedule where, okay, we, we sort of knew that if we get delayed, we're fine up until a certain point. Um, the next day I get the call, no go. Bad storms are coming in. They're going to stay here for a while. It's, uh, and, and I, they, they give me a, the, the live feed to a camera that's actually down in Antarctica. Outside my window, it's bright, clear blue skies. Three hours south of me, it is black and storming snow uh, all over the place. It's, so it's a bad situation. We're not going. They're saying that it's going to be like this for a couple of days. So another day wasted. We go and visit the penguins. Wake up the next morning. Anything? No, you're not going today again. So after the third day of canceling these shows, the manager that was with us was like, dude, how do we do this? Like, if their plane can't get us down there, whose plane can? So now you're in another situation. The people that you've contracted to get you down there are just are not delivering. The band and management want answers. They want action. What do you do? Here's another scenario. Anybody? Five one. Did you happen to charter a flight to get there? I started looking into it. Yes. Yeah. So I, I, essentially, if um, if the airplane wasn't going to be able to withstand the weather, even when it was like a little clear, um, then I figured, you know what, I need to go find somebody else that can. And so Bigger plane, bigger plane, or a, or a research vessel is where I'm going. Yeah. Once your once your traditional methods, you need a heavier. He, you know, light jets are not going to make it. So you need a, a like Maria in in the chat just now says, what about a military plane? I'm looking at a research vessel. Like when you're dealing with weather, you need heavier vessels. Yeah. Hang on, I'm going to show you guys what we got. That's Henry. Okay. So. What I found was because I was shipping gear down there and connecting or using my resources with my, uh, uh, my freight agent at the time, telling them the situation, what do you guys got down here that could help? And so I ended up contracting a, uh, oh wait, that's not it. This, wait, no, that's not it. Where's the? It says Hercules. Oh, yeah. Do you guys see this? I see a plane on an IC. I see potential runway short. Okay. I see it. Um, well, that's not even the picture of the plane I wanted to show you. But I ended up um, I ended up chartering what they call a Hercules plane. It's a, it's essentially a C-130 bomber that yeah. military used to, to drop whole battalions and tanks into war zones uh, and, and big equipment. Uh, th there's no seats. It's just a bench that folds down on the side of the walls. And, um, but we had this available to us and we were, uh, we had 
told the band about it and they were into it because at this point they were like world record on the line we need to do something to to get it done um and so i hired uh the this crazy ass plane to uh to take us down there it was um it was near it it was in santiago offloading some gear and then it could come get us pick us up take us down but it was going to need another day to refuel so we were banking on this um and then the next day the next day we got a call that um yeah i see mj you, you found a picture of it but it, it said um uh chile on the side of it uh the chilean navy but um so we ended up not being able to the plane couldn't come down because it wasn't ready it was being prepped and refueled and this happened to be the last day that the band could wait we now at, we're at a point where we were four and a half days stuck in punta arenas with nowhere to go um just trapped in the hotel and we the band had to get back to um had to get back to LA because they were going to be on Kids Choice Awards. So we had no choice but to call it, uh, leave Punta Arenas, go back to LAX, uh, and uh, and uh, do the award show. And as I was connecting into um, Santiago to to catch my flight to LA, I get a uh, a screen. I, I get a picture from our pilot, and this is a picture of the plane that I had hired landing into Antarctica. Cause they had already, it, it had already been loaded with equipment and supplies. So it was going down there anyways. So they're like, Hey, just so you know, it sucks. You guys left cause you're playing oh. down there and you, you could have made I'm not it. on it and you're not, Ugh. you're headed home to your next show. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, the, the moral of, of, of this story, I feel like, or the, the lessons that I learned out of this, um, a is to first not be afraid of these big scenarios that you may be asked to, to, to execute. Like, yeah, we do shows every day and these are big scenarios as it is, but when you're asked to do something really extreme outside of the norm, um, to, uh, look at it as an amazing opportunity to learn and, um, as uncomfortable or challenging as it may be the growth that you will get out of it. Like I have more experience in putting on a show in Antarctica than most tour managers. And I didn't even do it, but if someone does, I'm the guy they should call. And I like having that skill set under my belt. Um, second lesson I think for me was, uh, was failure. This was actually, I consider it was like one of the biggest failures I had of, of my career. Um, and, and I know it's like, I shouldn't be so hard on myself cause it's weather. Right. But like, I didn't get it. Like we didn't get there. And, and that sticks with you as a tour manager. Cause you put, you put everything into it. Um, and then when it, uh, when it just doesn't come to fruition, it's like, it's hard to let that go. And I've sort of been carrying this one with me, uh, for a long time. Uh, the third obvious lesson is weather's unpredictable. So, um, you know, watch it carefully or it'll, it'll really mess you guys up. And a side lesson, always have a good jet guy. Yeah. Whether or not you use yeah. them on the regular or at all, it behooves you to have contact with someone that can broker a jet that is not necessarily your travel agent. You just want to have that in your back pocket, particularly if you're trying to do one of those can't get there from here scenarios. Mm. So look, I found some... Um... I found, look, this is the stack of tickets that was supposed to go out. Never Boo. handed out, still in plastic. Boo. Yeah, it's a shame. But uh, this is part of my souvenir collection that I pulled out for you guys. But that's, that's my lesson. Maybe next time I'll share the Mexico story with you. All right. Um, I, yeah, I think it's, as in, as in my guess. It's you, go Marky. All right. Go um, un uncaffeinated Mark, uncaffeinated Mark. I, I hope I threw this together well. Uh, I'm gonna take us back to the States on my story. It's a very common one that we run into as tour managers. I know y'all have heard some very wild stories involving Antarctica and Europe, a lot of international scenarios. So I thought I'd take us back to the States. 
Um, so to give a little background, this was, it was this year. Um, it was in fe- it was in January, so it was considered we were on a winter tour. We were dealing with snow and those type of conditions. We had, we had made it to the West Coast. Um, we were making our way up. We were to kind of the tail end leg of our West Coast run. We have made it to Oregon. Uh, we had just wrapped up our Portland show. Everything had been advanced. I do have some photos, which I'll bring out here in a second. Um, but we were making it to Seattle. So we had made it up kind of to the finish line of our West Coast run. Um, we had a couple tour buses on us, which can make it a little tricky. Um, the venue we were playing in Seattle was the Showbox, not the Showbox Soda, which is a little more accommodating. Dealing with the Showbox is downtown. It's directly across the street from the marketplace, which can be very high packed traffic area for pedestrians and cars. You're in downtown. It's very tough. Uh, to move tour buses around that area, especially too. And uh, they, they're in the past, they've had this parking available. So I wasn't too worried about it. It was available as the tour is running. It was available as we started the West Coast tour and we're getting all the way up to it. And then out of nowhere, it's not available anymore. And I'm gonna show you a little, I'm gonna show you a little map here. Um, of my parking map to just kind of give you an idea and do a screen share. Um, I should be able to preview it. See if y'all can see this. Yeah. Can y'all see that? Um, Yeah, so just kind of give you an idea of of the parking map situation, you know, kind of taking a look at that. Um, Let me see if I can go a little bit further out here so y'all can see that Um, there we go um so street parking wasn't really an option you know so we're looking at our load-in area right around here uh this is kind of the standard uh park bus and trailer even for one so the we didn't even have a two bus trailer option we were going to have to move um one of the buses we were going to have to have one driver active going into this scenario to give you kind of an idea the marketplace is like directly across the street like the sign the whole deal um so this option got canceled out and this wasn't even an option to begin with so street parking wasn't really something that they do maybe just kind of for a load in load out so how this gets tricky is our drive the next day was to boise and if you've done this run before, it is through high, high mountains, you're dealing with snow. We had mentioned this in a couple of our, our webinars where if you're going towards that, that area, you have to go through a lot of mountains. It adds a lot of time to your drives. And then you're looking at close to near 500 miles, which is like you're really pushing the meter on what you can feasibly do. So we're, we're dealing with a situation now that you can't, you, we have to not be, we have to park our buses no matter what without them being moved. It was, it was super tight and we literally, things just hit the fan as we were approaching this and had to rethink how we were gonna do, uh, do our bus parking to make the show happen and for our bus drivers to not um, have to move the buses to make that next show work. And I can show you a little bit of the routing here just to kind of paint a picture for you. like. That seven hour and 44 minutes is easily 10 to 11 hours. Um, And there's some other variables around that, which I wanna see if our students will pick up, but I'm gonna stop right here to kind of see where everyone's heads at and I'll let you know how it happened, how it all kind of came together. Can you go back to that that other slide that showed the the information? I kind of wanted to look at that. Yeah, yeah, one second. Let me see if I can go back. Um, Okay, so that, but that wasn't um, available where they showed the the bus and trailer parking yeah so that's that ended up actually getting booked out for an event and the owner that owned that parking lot i guess they had had some disagreements and just was not budging so he just pretty much gave us the middle finger and just said tough you're just gonna have to deal with it and and wouldn't give us access to that parking area so let me bring this parking back up so you can take a look at it and uh one second sorry about that um there. Can you see that now? What okay. time are you arriving into? So our load-ins were relatively around 11 noon. 
Um, so we so we were trying to get in at least an hour or two early in advance just to assess any type of situation that may occur. You don't know if people are parked in certain areas and then that gives us some breathing room to kind of navigate any unknown um, situations as we arrive to prepare. Um, so we were getting in around 10. We, we would park one of our buses at the Soto. So that was an option to have one of our buses out there. So um, yeah, that's kind of that's kind of where we were at going into it. Hmm. All right. So you got no parking, but uh, all right. You said you're getting in early though. So you're trying to scope out like what is available and I don't know. I hope you, I hope you found something and you had cones in the trailer. Um, I'd love to hear from our students. See what, see what they're saying in the, the, uh, chat. Let me stop sharing for a second and then I'll share. Um, I'll share what, what ended up working out. Let's see if, I was going to say, I, John Paul had asked if there was alternative parking. And I was going to say in that area, there really isn't. Like the only other option would be to drive the buses away, but then that doesn't work with bus driver's hours. Right, Mark? Yeah. And yeah. We had, I had gotten with our travel agent to literally scope out every single hotel in that area to see if anything, ha if there was any like bigger RV parking availability and to throw another wrench into that situation. The hotel that had agreed to let that said that there is bus parking available when we arrived to take care of my Soto parked bus it when we arrived there it was not available so that was so we had literally I'd moved the bus over there into downtown which is not easy to do especially during like noon 11 noon that time Ooh, and it I'm wasn't mad available. At that I'm oh. so mad if I'm showing up <laughs> especially in I yelled at the hotel. It was pretty, I feel bad. I apologize. But I was like, they were on call with us, reassured us that it was available, like totally on it and then got there. And it was the classic, oh, that was must have been the night shift person. I'm so sorry. That was not us. So we can't help you. <laughs> classic. <laughs> like it was the other shift scenario confirmed the whole deal. And uh, but yeah, um, it's let's see what some people say a lot of you, wait did you say you had a trailer we had two trailers you had trailers. Two, buses, two buses okay. and two trailers so parking somewhere else isn't you have you're considering gear yeah we're considering so i want to remind everybody drop the trailer, yeah. drop the trailer send the buses away helps with space if you got limited at least you know get the trailers in there well we had we had had the option if you if you noticed on the the parking availability, we had the option to bag for only load in, load out. So we, so we were able to accommodate one bus. We couldn't use the parking or it had not been done yet. So um, this was kind of a first scenario. I mean, I can go in or maybe we can bring someone. Would we like to bring a student in? Can you see any students that might want to see what, I'd love to hear what they do or, you know, what their thoughts are around it. If um, we'd like to bring anyone in on it. But Amanda Forbes here. She her question of is there a way to park wherever the drivers were meant to stay overnight and then transport the gear back and forth with a different vehicle? That's a great idea. It's possible. The cross load. Oh Can you hear me? Yeah. No, you can be welcome. Thank That's a you. Good idea. What, sorry, uh, recap what your idea was. So I this was just an idea because I've never had a situation like this before, but I was thinking if would there be a way to park the bus wherever it was meant to be parked um, overnight um, or wherever the bus drivers were staying and then to get some sort of vehicle that the bus drivers wouldn't have to drive that we could use to transport the gear back and forth between wherever the bus was and the venue. You mean like a runner's vehicle possibly? Yes, vehicle. but depending on how much equipment there was, it might need yeah. to be something bigger. So, so at this point, the only options they'd really laid out for us, they'd love to use their other venue as kind of a crutch. So they wanted to kind of just have our buses live at Soto and then have, in, in a normal case scenario, say we were going south, say we were going to Portland, that wouldn't have been a problem. We could have just had them drive over. We could, you know, do our loadout and we could start our, start our bus logs. No big deal. So our biggest task here was the overhaul drives and really trying to tighten that number down um, to sort of where we could feasibly make that work. And I had had some overdrives factored into that. We had 
we had ran through that with the bus company in, in advance. So we knew that that was going to be a tight scenario. Um, what eventually happened was that they had banged, they had, I had went out and looked at it from across the street and looked at, I said, could we feasibly park the buses in the front? Well, they were like, well, if we back one trailer up to the, to the actual parking spot where you drive into the parking lot, we're not blocking anyone. So the trailer two one trailer in could be at that farthest point and the bags went far enough down just a bit that we slowly just started to pick at the cars as they moved and just started putting in no parking signs and winged it to, to leave more of an additional space towards the back end going past the venue down. And what I did was I took both bus ends and parked the noses together to where one trailer end, one trailer end didn't block anything substantial to get us a red flag and notice and the, the normal backed positions didn't have us too far. It was literally the perfect window as tight as possible to where they could both live there. And I got a picture of it, how I ended up putting facing it the wrong way. Yeah. <laughs> facing the wrong way. Put both, the street. <laughs> put, yeah. But no, uh, yeah. On, in front of the venue, put both the, the head, the front of the buses together, just like that. And they never done it before. And it was the first time it had ever been done. Um, so let me, I'll show you how it ended up looking. I'm going to share right now. Um, someone's gig all day just to stand out there and wait for cars to leave. Yeah. I mean, we had to do, we had to do what we had to do and, uh, it ended up working out and we didn't get any trouble from the, uh, from the police and the show went on and we were able to get in an hour. Um, so that's how it ended up looking out from across the street. Um, you can see the parking lot there on the left side and that's the show box entrance right there. Um, and we're able to have our buses live there all day without having our bus drivers have to come and move the buses. And we were able to get, get out on time uh, and get down to Boise at a relatively good hour. So. Wow. That's that was, the idea. Yeah. That was, that was how I was able to kind of pull that together and uh, keep the tour moving. And uh, that was a little bit of way of kind of trying to think outside the box in a not settling for no mentality. Mark, so, how long did that take like for, all that space to open up for both buses. I mean, I know that street in Seattle, like it's impossible. Like people just park up there all day for like forever. One of the, one of the bus drivers was a little more lenient on kind of the, um, like he would like go when he went and got checked in, he was like, so we knew that we could park that one bus there 100% without having to be moved. Yeah. Um, when we, when we uh, got our bus drivers settled in, he, there was some, a little bit of some leniency, especially with our overdrives already factored in, he was able to kind of work his magic um, and, and kind of make that work where he had a little more breathing room without feeding into logs, super heavy. So always be in good terms with your bus drivers and they will work magic for you if they can. That is- Was, the was this before, um, I'm assuming this was before the DOT regulations got stricter? And you were dealing more with overdrives or we we had an overdrive factored in already um, <laughs> we that, that was going to be an overdrive the following day but this was this year this was oh in, okay yeah this was in uh late january february so um, wow i was wondering if Amazing. anyone picked up i know that it doesn't really play into it but we even had that uh boise is uh mountain time so that was another headache, another wrench into the scenario that just, we lost an hour immediately. So that was another um, timing uh, issue, time yeah. zone wise that I had to deal with. What, what did your bus call end up being? Because they, to finally figure this out, it kept your drivers up much longer than you probably wanted them to be, right? Like, so you, you would have had to push bus call back super late to accommodate the yeah, we had, we had to push it a little bit. Um, they were already well slept, you know, I think it's kind of like a minimum 10 on or a minimum, you know, and a 10 on 10 off like sleeping wise. So I mean, we definitely were like to, we had to be like, we were on the tee for that scenario. I mean, it was like, they got their minimum sleep or their maximum sleep they're allowed to get. Like we have to leave at this certain point to make that happen. And like, we played by the rules, you know, but and it was it was we knew that going into it, it was going to be stressful. So Everyone was on board mentally. We, we knew that this was going to be tight for us. So 
Amanda, I know you said you hadn't been in a situation like this, but it was cool to see your thought process of like, well, maybe there's another way. You know, that's exactly like what we're getting at, because that could be the answer as well. Uh, and then, um, who was it, Annie G? Whatever you can do to make it work. <laughs> yeah, and, and Annie G had a great uh, solution, possible solution, uh, of finding arena, stadiums, any big parking lots that the uh, motors may have a relationship with. I mean, it would have been, it would have sucked to get the move the gear and everything, um, but you would have gotten the show done. Yeah. It, that show, that venue sucks anyways, getting gear and You have to go up that flight of stairs and that. Yeah. yeah um legendary but, but, the, but the show box appreciated it and they they've started to kind of make that more of a parking option for the future so i, I hope that they're they currently are integrating well not at this moment unfortunately but it was a new way to think about it and the venues then you started looking at it in a, in a new way after that so thanks so yeah. anda next time that happens to you remember what mark did yeah we actually, you know what? We actually had Karen, who is on here, who said that that's the venue that she PMs at. Oh yeah. I it would be really that. interesting if she's able to give some input. <laughs> Karen Renee, right? Yeah. I don't know if she's there. We could ask the question. <laughs> Yay. Hey. Hi. Hi. Hey, what's I'm happening? Um, you know, just it's not working. <laughs> um yeah i mean the parking is an absolute nightmare um it always has been um we get no parks for the street out front um if they're done in advance on time um we do rely on soto we've used that venue for people to actually shower because like you mentioned it's 1200 cap room we have no showers we've got nothing um, and you have to walk through the venue to get to the green rooms. So that's the other nightmare of not having the buses on site. Um, we've also used the Seahawks Stadium to park buses there and then uh, parking at the Paramount as well. Right, if there's not a show there. Wow. Right. I do love your venue. It's been years since I've been there. I miss it. <laughs> we my, all do. <laughs> my back still hurts from loading in there. Yeah. It's one of those venues where it's like, oh my God, like logistically, this is a pain in the ass, but it's a really great venue <laughs> to like play at and hang out and everybody's great. But you know what? The, the document that Mark had, mm -hmm. great document to share. It, it gave all the details of scenarios and like, here's what you're really up against. This is their best case scenario. Here are the steps. And so then there's no question. It's Mark understood what he was going into. I mean, that's exactly the yeah you want to give to the touring acts coming through yeah and i've got one that has maps with pictures out front and then it also shows where you can park at soto and all that because we understand that you know with the overdrives and stuff there's only so much you can do wow. yeah and that's got to be more of a, a more uh common scenario as well i feel like more more bands are going up the west coast than they coming across and then shooting down so i would assume the show box or seattle's seeing a lot of that crossover into boise the next day and and or like see you know salt lake city or something like that you know you're seeing more of that those kind of drives over yeah and we get a lot of like first day of tour kind of things as well so yeah a lot of shipping yeah. and all that kind of stuff coming in. something i think that you guys have been that i've done in the past you guys have been really great about too because the owner you know after a certain amount of hours they charge like you know it's like there's a certain amount included but i've ended a tour there before mm -hmm. and we knew that like we hardly needed anything for hospitality, you know? Cause it was like, why do you need like peanut butter that's just gonna go in the trash, you know? Cause you like, it's the end of the, it's the end of the tour. So we've been creative with the budgets and reallocated, you know, some budget money that we weren't gonna use into paying for some extra hours of parking. And you guys have always been mm -hmm. really good about finagling that and just been really good at like different scenarios to make it work, you know? Yeah, so. it's, a, it's a nightmare every day. <laughs> I call it a surprise party. It's a surprise party every day. <laughs> surprise party every day. Karen, Karen, we are so thankful for you, and I'm glad that you're a part yes. of this with us too. I'm glad you're here to kind of put in some insight on it. So yeah, thank yeah. you so yeah, much. So thank you cool. Again. Say hi to Jana. Uh, I just talked to her earlier today. She's <laughs> oh, doing really good. Small <laughs> world. We'll see you up there soon. Okay. Awesome. Bye. Thanks, Karen. All right. So we made it. We made it to Adrian. Either All right. Shifting gears out of the bus world. Sort of. 
sort of. I'll leave uh, it to you. And now I'll we're finishing our tour. Yeah, now we're at the end. So here we are. We are at the end of a fairly hefty tour that was really, really ambitious in, we had a lot of dates to get in there over three months and it was a haul. Um, we have, I think we're at 11, 11 trucks and nine buses plus my A party. This is a three party tour, A's, B's and C's. Um, everybody rolling kind of large. Um, my A party is a combo bus and private charter. We are doing some regional hubbing. There is a family situation involved. So when my family is together on the ground, we're all good. But if we are hubbing and the family aspect stays at home while the working parent gets on a jet and comes and does a show, I've got to watch that weather every second because working parent needs to get back to the family regardless. That's a priority. So there's a lot of pressure. So we're at the last night of the tour. We're ending. We're ending in Atlanta. We're all there. It is the last show day. I have a, a slew of superstar special guests coming to personal personify their video cameos for the first time right so all this is going on we have an after party that is attended and hosted by celebrities as well my major pressure that day is that jets like buses have time periods that you that their flight crews can work i have an artist that needs seven hours in the venue pre-show i need to get that artist wheels up to the venue, into the venue, show done, to the after party and back to the FBO, wheels up every single thing. I had spent probably hours on the phone between my charter person and the personal assistant in charge of logistics going, guys, in order to do this this way and go back to the other city instead of bringing everybody to town if you guys really want to stay where you are, this is what we're going to have to do. So that is a whole very important scenario. We're at the venue. It's about three o'clock. I have released most of my buses by now, not the artist buses, because we like to have them on site for when they're in. Um, I've released my, my B party buses, and I believe that the C party buses were about to roll. It's about three in the afternoon. And it comes to my attention that the Atlanta airport, this is the last day of the tour. We're going home tomorrow. We're in Atlanta and the Atlanta airport has lost power and is shut down and nobody can say why this is happening. I'm blinking at this point. What do I do? And I, I would love to add to that because I know when you were telling us about that story, I was actually in Taiwan when the Atlanta airport shut down. I don't know for anyone right. who's touring around when that happened, right. it was a thing. I like, need to, I just need, it was crazy. I just need so, to explain to everyone that Atlanta, for those of you who don't know, Atlanta is Delta Airlines major hub. It is yeah. also one of the major international airports mm -hmm. on the Eastern seaboard. I this think it's the biggest international airport in the US, isn't it? No. I think, yeah. I don't think so. I thought it was. I think, but either way, so here yeah. we are. It's, it's a big. mess. And, and, and the thing is, you have, what you have to know intrinsically going into this is that if this is happening to us, it's also happening to the entire <laughs> Eastern seaboard, anything coming and going internationally. So we're at a complete shutdown and we don't have any information about what's happening and how we get out of it. So question, Adrian, is is this gonna affect your artist or is your biggest concern about the artist just making well, sure that they point, get out in time? My problem is that I'm concerned about, about my artist, but my FBO is fine. So my right. A party is okay. So assuming that they hit every single mark, mm -hmm. we'll be okay there. 
It's they just have to every, leave by a certain time right, at night. They have, okay. But they've got to hit every single mark to make sure that this works or we're not stuck. So okay. that's a looming potential issue while I am figuring out what I need to do in this moment. Nick says it's the world, Nick Gold says it's the world's busiest airport. Okay, yeah, there you go. Really? Yep, 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 okay. I thought right. So question. anybody, I what, what's Hong the Kong first, busy. what's the first, what, Shelly Cohen, yes, that's right. That's right, the Atlanta power shutdown happened on the last day when I was trying to fly everyone home for winter break. It's also peak travel season, kids. It's the 17th of December. What's so, time? you know, okay. every, it's, yeah. it's mass. I got, I got major problems. So tell me, my friends, what is, what am I doing? And you had just been dropped off by the buses at the airport. We, we were not at the airport. We were at the gig. We woke up and went to the gig, okay? Got it. So the guys, took us to the venue, find out how far away the buses are. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. That's a good one. Okay. What else? Mm, yeah. First, who's my first phone call, you guys? Travel agent. Travel agent. Start looking at those flights. What now, are I want to tell you, I want to tell you. Drive to um, Charlotte. Yep. I want to tell you that at this point, I don't know when the airport is going to open up. But personally, I am not the kind of person that waits to see what happens. We begin to scorpion snatch back the control of the situation as soon as we understand that it's potentially getting away from us. We gotta start evasive maneuvers now, because why? The rest of the entire world's going to get jammed up in this mess too. So, being a professional traveler and logistics person, I got to get out in front of this fast. So, what am I doing? I am pulling a department head meeting. I'm letting everybody know what's happening. Now, as this is progressing, we're getting further towards showtime. I need to talk to people. I'm also dealing with a, with a very, very busy professional group of performers. I have 18 people on stage with my principal. They are now coming in and telling me about their TV appearances that they have the next day. And this is everybody from the band to the MD, to the Pro Tools guy, to my sound guy, front of house, they're busy. We gotta go. They have plans. Now, again, this is like a blizzard, but not. All right, so everybody's really smart. Everybody's doing really well here. So what we did, and I'm pleased for, for all of the, the great, um, and, and you guys that are pros, you should know, so I expect it. Um, I'd like to hear from some folks who have not done a tour or who are not professional yet, if anybody has an idea, I'd love to see it before I tell you exactly what went down. Um, I will let you know that the first call is always to the travel agent we're gonna get in, we're gonna get hit. Start looking at things now, start planning now. So what did we do? Um, we absolutely split everybody up. One of the things that I wanna share with you guys, protocol for me, I don't, I, sometimes you, you, you're better off sending people in different directions. So we decided, we were able to call the buses back. I called Mark Larson at Hempel. I said, ah, mayday, mayday. Uh, this is definitely going down. I really don't feel like we're gonna get any good information out of Atlanta. Can I turn these buses around? They were close, they were not too far for me to get them all back. So we got them all back. Ultimately, we decided to send the crew to Nashville. That way, and that's, that's you know, four, four and a half hours, but, that gives everybody time to do this proper loadout, to go back to the hotel and get some rest and to bug out of Atlanta as early as possible and get to Nashville for afternoon or evening flights. For my A party, I would like to tell you that my artist did get on that plane and we went literally, I had a, I remember this like it was yesterday. <clears throat> 1.12 a.m. wheels needed to go up on that jet. That jet went wheels up at 1.11. So that was something that was, was out, off my plate. Thank you very much. But again, it's not off your plate until it's off your plate, okay? Yeah. It isn't a done deal until that plane's in the air. Yeah. 
You know what I mean? Because between getting ready, special guests, visiting a show, the after show that happens in the dressing room, visiting people, visiting family, then you're still going to go to an after party somewhere else. Anything can happen. So A party sorted and on the way. Now we've got C party sorted on the way. For B party, thank you very much to everyone who voted Charlotte. Birmingham, I'm not trying to go to a very small airport. I need an international airport because I also have, I've got people, I've got A-party people and others that reside in Europe. So I need an international airport. Yeah, Charlotte. I, also, I also needed my people to go and have this opportunity to have this very swanky after party end of tour. This is a big deal. It was, it was really, there was a lot of trials and tribulations. So this after party was as important to everyone. Did, you know, so no, I did not get to enjoy my special guests. I didn't get to hang out with Samuel L. Jackson. I did not get to see the last show. I did not get to go to, go to the last after show party. I was on the phone with my trusted loyal travel agent until four o'clock in the morning, jam issuing tickets, just <laughs> issuing every last ticket. Um, I would like to tell you that everybody got home. No child was left behind in Atlanta, in Atlanta. No people didn't make it home when they were supposed to. The entire tour ended up arriving home on the day that they were meant to go home with no traveling hysteria. It so worked out. There's a lot that had to line up right there to make that happen with flights. But then even- And you guys, and you guys, I was upset. I was upset. I was really bummed out. I was frustrated. This tour, um, Mich uh, Lisa, no change fees because the airport shut down. We can't go anywhere. So, so that was that. Was that. There, you know, but, but again, you've got to have, have travel agents that you can call up and go, you better call these airlines and let them know we're going to need waivers and we don't have time for them yeah. to doodle around. Again, yeah, you, you know, you, just you, to buy new tickets, just yeah. issue new tickets and we'll yeah. deal with yeah. those yeah. ones that were affected after. Yeah. And you got to call everybody in your organization and say, heads up, we are, we are absolutely going into crisis aversion mode. Um, I'm going to minimize the financial damage as best as we can, but you know you have to understand that when when the airport shuts down, it's over to the airlines to figure it out. So we were able to rebook just about everybody, um, at least. Did I have someone on my team I could recruit as support? Well, production handled the crew as they do, so it was divided that way. And as far as support. Um, that's my travel agent. That's my, you know, that's my support team. I don't have, didn't have an assistant on that one. You guys met Cassidy Blaine on the diversity panel. Cassidy just came and sat in my office and then sat in my hotel room and handed me bottles of water. That's really all you can do. You, all you can really do is continue to, you've got to, you've got to organize what your preemptive strikes are going to be. You've got to really just, you know, I was upset and people were also upset. And understand also this tour was sick. Um, we had, you know, 16 people that saw a doctor the day before and had sent our A1 home. So it was stressful for people. Patty Byrne had a good question. In a crisis, when do you call management? Is it a first call or do you try to figure it out first? Yeah, the, the answer may be circumstantial to whatever the situation is. But, you know, you, there's a fine line there because, you you know, management's going to want to be in the know. Communication is key. But if you can call that manager and tell them that you've already fixed this problem that happened 20 minutes ago, yep. that's a much better call to get. And yep. or at least like, hey, there's a problem, but I'm working on this solution. Mm -hmm. I'd maybe call them once I had one, two or three sort of yeah. Yeah. solutions. Yeah. I do like that Oh, keep going. I'm sorry. I was just going to say, like, in my situation, I sorted all of that out. Once I got them on the plane, I called management. And because it was happening, I mean, that was happening. Like, yeah. whether or not I called management, like, they weren't going to fix something. So at that point, I let them know. I just, you know, there's nothing they can 
they could do in that particular situation to really fix anything. So right. it was more informational. And then at that point, they were able to say to me, hey, if there's anything we can do to put a, you know, call into the consulate or anything like that, they could say that, but. You know, I feel like you, you have some management that they have you, they literally have us on the tour so they don't have to stress about what's happening on the road. So management for me is always last, last call. If I like what Henry was saying, what MJ was saying, like I'll have solutions for them and be like, this is how I solve that problem. Um, if, if we do get to the finish line and it's like, we've done everything that we could do humanly possible. And here we are, this is our situation. Then I update, I update management and I'm like, we did our best and this is what it is. And I think that goes a lot further than just calling them and just letting them know you have a problem. They're probably going to tell you to fix it. <laughs> so so be best to handle it and come with solutions for sure. So Adrian, did you ever call management to let them know what was going on? No need to call management, my friend. They are sitting in the office with me every day. Oh yeah, they're there. Oh, oh. <laughs> well, management, management. So they saw the play-by-play. -play. <laughs> Good. They can see how valuable you are, and like yeah. why you know when we actually turn on, and our critical thinking has to turn on to fix the situation. That's exactly why they pay us the big bucks, and we get to put a management title at the end of our name uh, for situations like that, folks. I mean, that's yeah, that's great that they got to see you in action. Always. And in that particular act, it was um, a intense micromanagement situation. So they were you generally- really You got really lucky that the buses could turn around. They could have been 100%, heading- 100%, 100%. They could have been going to another- got, got them back. We really got them back just in the nick of time. Yeah. yeah that's crazy. I think um, Phoebe had an interesting point. She said it would be interesting to hear case studies from around the time of 9-11. And we don't- have time now but that would be a really good one to do in the future because i think some of us probably have some good yeah good stories the other thing the other thing about how we handled that too is just rolling people out in waves understanding who's got to go where you know it's the same way that you would in this particular case the same way that you would have maybe potentially sorted out show call transport or or you know leaving the leaving the the hotel for the airport you've got you know the way the way i grouped the departures out to charlotte was you know we've got about four hours to get there so i want you to get there two hours before your flight so we leaving six hours and everybody who's on this block of flights is going to roll out at this time um, may, don't be looking for your, your regular bus because you will be probably on, you know, you've got to explain to people when you're changing up their plans, exactly what to do. Don't be looking for your regular bus. You know, you're going to go on this bus. These are the people that are going to be on it. And you sort of give everyone a list so they know who their bus mates are. Um, you know, that way you, you kind of enact a little bit of the buddy system for them. Yeah. You know, and, and also, I, I always, as a rule, send myself home, not the day that, with everyone else, but I stay an extra day. I stay on the ground until all of my ducklings are home as much as possible. That way, if somebody is in the air or some calamity happens, I'm still on the ground GPSing everybody home. It, That's something that, that maybe is prudent. I like maybe to do one taught me that, that like, I don't know when I learned that, that the tour manager should be the last one to leave. Mm. Like all boots off the ground before you leave yeah. that city, you know? Yeah. Um, that's actually saved a lot of people. Like when flights go wrong, things go wrong on that day, that morning, mm -hmm. if you're in the air, like, yeah. You, yeah. I try to, I try you know, to get in first and get out last. You know what else is great about that, about yeah. staying an extra day is you can get all your counting done before you go home. I Which is it. it's so nice to roll home. You're like, I'm done. With first all of my in, cash accounting. First, first my man in, last man out. You know, <laughs> always. Quick story. I once ended a tour like that, where like I got everybody home, and then I booked my flight out of the next state over, and I made a little challenge for myself to figure out how to get from there to there, in to the next state over with a rental car and drive and everything to make the flight in time. Just because I wasn't done touring, I was like, I'm gonna try. I'm going to challenge myself and purposely book 
flight in the wrong. I would be booking a manicure just so you know before. <laughs> I was not a rental car. <laughs> I, I like using the mileage too. <laughs> But um, I'm glad you guys really liked this, uh, the case study scenario. We thought it was really important to, uh, you know, to sort of test everybody's thought process and see uh, all the different ways that you can approach something as well. Like, I hope you put yourselves in our shoes and felt the stress levels that we felt in those moments, because that's something that we can't, can't give you through the screen. But when your heart's going like this and shit's going wrong and you still have to open doors and get after show food going and deal with that problem. It is the real thing. And that's what we hope to train you here for, uh, not just how to do Excel, but for those real yeah. life moments. Um, so you're prepared for it. Uh, but maybe we'll do this one again, actually. I think this is fun. Um, so uh, Monday? Yeah, mo Monday we yeah. have uh, the recap with Doug, which yeah. we are super excited about. Yeah. And if any of you guys, uh, I'm just going to show this really quick. This is the this is the show tonight. And if any of you guys uh, got everybody who put their email in the chat got that. But if anybody else wants to watch that tonight, throw your email in the chat, and uh, you'll get an email later on this afternoon from the streaming service for, with a login. Perfect. Yeah, that's great. So you know what we're referring to if you want to check it out. That's awesome. So then Monday we'll recap that and uh, with Doug's crew uh, from July talk. So have a great weekend, everybody. And uh, well, have a great weekend. And uh, thank you for being with us. We made it to 40. We're over. We're, we're moving into our 40s. <laughs> We're in our 40s. All right. Everyone have, a, everyone have a great weekend. I'm out of here. I'm taking a weekend trip. You guys be safe. Zoom wave. Bye. Bye. <laughs> oh, I see some last minute emails coming in. Oh, wait. yeah. Will it open for a minute? Let this be awkward. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you? What's your weekend trip, Henry? Uh, I'm cashing. I cashed in a, a bunch of Marriott points to uh, uh, um, uh, Ritz Carlton Laguna Niguel. Nice. nice. So, that is a hell of a staycation. Yeah. 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 Uh, it's like uh, you know, I'm gonna do like the you know the water view thing with the fireplace. And honestly, all we want to do is just get away and order room service for a whole weekend. That uh, sounds incredible. Yeah, that sounds amazing. Definitely earned it. So 